Well, hello, and welcome to the Master of Science in Human Development and Early Childhood Disorders Breakout Information Session. We refer to this program as the HDCDMS program. That's the acronym I will use today, too. It's HDCDMS. I'm Dr. Meredith Grant and serve as the program head for this master's degree and for the Child Learning and Development Undergraduate Program. And I hope that today I can convey what an outstanding university and program this is. Paula Goldman is a student currently in our program. She's a fast track student, which means that she did part of her undergraduate training at the same time as her graduate training. Paula, would you like to introduce yourself a little bit? Sure thing. Um, hello, well, like Dr. Grant was saying, my name is Paola. Um, I am currently in my second year of my master's, so um, I only have this semester and next left. Um, I'm really looking forward to graduation, but I'm definitely going to uh, be missing the program and everything that we go through each semester. It's been it's been a good ride. I'm gonna miss you. <laughs> but I want you to graduate too. Yeah. Christy Noel is the academic support coordinator for this program and for the psychology master's degree program too. That position is like what academic advisors do at the undergraduate level, but it's also so much more. Christy, would you like to say more about that? Um, no, um, I'm just looking forward to... Uh talking more about this program. London was in um, the MS Psychology uh, breakout session. So she, okay. she knows me. Oh, okay, <laughs> got it. Well, um, this is our agenda for today. We will start with an overview of this program, including requirements and curriculum. We'll turn to field placements, also addressing how those experiences lend themselves to different career paths. And we'll address the admissions application process and end with Q&A. Um, yeah. There we go. The HCCD MS program um, has objectives involving both traditional classes and field experiences that support graduates in preparation to enter the market to work in early childhood intervention careers, or ECI, in schools, medical settings, nonprofits, and more. These jobs are varied and dynamic, and students need to have content knowledge and practical experiences and the professional skills to be able to be successful. Graduates of our program enter the market prepared to apply knowledge about typical and atypical child development from infancy to age five or often slightly older. They're prepared to administer comprehensive developmental assessments to plan and implement intervention services. The assessment tools that are used in ECI workplaces can vary so in our courses, we focus on supporting students in learning some of the most common assessments, but also in readiness to learn any developmental assessment that they might need to be able to administer in the field. We prepare students to apply ethical professional practices to work with children, families, and the community. Um, and when working with children and families from diverse backgrounds, especially children with developmental delays and disorders, these Ethical issues can be a little bit unexpected and complex, maybe a little bit different from what you would see in a traditional educational environment. Students are prepared to critically evaluate research evidence to implement best practices in the field. This is a research-based curriculum. Research literacy is a requirement as ECI practitioners should have the tools they need to stay abreast of the latest research findings. For this program though, it's an option, but not a requirement to work in a research lab or to take statistics. So research literacy is a requirement, but working to actually conduct research is an elective for this program. Students are prepared to show increased self-awareness through reflective supervision. Throughout field placement experiences, students are enrolled in a supervision class on campus that is supplementary to the supervision that they, that they also receive on site. I see another one of our students, Maria, has joined as well. Hi, Maria. It's nice hey, to have Dr. you. Hey, Dr. Brennan. 
Thank you for being with us. I'm just sorry. I was, I was, I'm sorry for being late. I was having some technical issues. So we welcome you now or late or whenever <laughs> you get here. Thank you. So here are some of the program highlights. This is a two-year applied program, five semesters, including one summer semester. So you start in a fall, you go through spring, summer, fall, spring, graduate. You're almost there, guys. Um, students build specialized knowledge of child development from birth to age five or older. Coursework is combined with supervised field experiences. That's two semesters, one semester with 10 hours a week at practicum, in the next semester with 20 hours a week at internship. So the first opportunity is a little bit more like a shadowing experience or where you're starting to get some of the training. And this second opportunity is a little bit more like a professional experience in the field uh, where you're working at more substantial block of hours and they're really starting to rely on you more in that workplace setting. We also have professional development. Um, training provided throughout the program. The first year starts with a monthly professional development seminar series, and the second continues with that information embedded in your supervision classes on campus. A typical student in the HTCD program has completed an undergraduate degree in a related major or with related coursework, and they start the program as a graduate student in the fall of their first year. We only take applicants to start in that fall semester. The HTCD program requires 39 graduate credit hours. 21 hours of those are core courses, which are listed there, nine hours of that is approved advanced electives. And the timing when you take those electives is a little bit varied. We have suggested timing in red. You can see that we're generally suggesting students go ahead and start in the spring of their first year and take another elective in the summer. It is harder to fit electives when you're at practicum and internship because you're working in the field and that may involve a commute. Uh, it, it just gets more challenging to schedule all of your hours. You have nine hours of applied practicum and internship experience. Those are in the second year of fall, the second year of spring, and they're listed at HDCD 6V20 practicum and internship. You can see how these courses are distributed in the plan of study because many of the HDC courses are sequenced and because many of our courses are prerequisites for field experience. Students, traditional students in this program do follow this very specific plan. So for example, that means they take infancy before they take the preschool years and they take assessment theory before they take developmental assessment. And all of those things happen before they ever go to practicum and internship. The times to take electives are a little bit more flexible, and we suggest that you take those soon when possible, but also when there's an elective option that you really want to take, and those options change as we try to support students. Some of the electives we've been able to offer recently in court include courses like trauma-informed care, there's a seminar on autism, social and communication disorders, and medical and biobehavioral disorders, which is a course that helps students distinguish between the disorders that one might see diagnosed in a pediatric office compared to the disorders one might see in other settings. Some students also choose to work in developmental research labs for elective credits. Paula, are there classes that especially stood out for you or what's been most helpful from the student perspective? Um, well, our core classes are obviously very important, um, but from the electives that I've taken, I, they have absolutely been my favorite. Um, we did uh, trauma, the trauma informed um, class uh, over the summer. It was absolutely amazing uh 10 out of 10 would recommend to anybody who goes through the program and has a chance to take it um it was very eye-opening to a lot of like precursors of what we might see uh families struggle with or that affect child development um it was just very helpful to connect everything we we learn in the core classes core classes and see how like trauma or just like family struggles might affect that development 
right? And that might come up in, in the assessments and the working with the children. Um, that one was really good. Currently, I am also taking social communications. It is also a really amazing class. Um, a lot of people don't realize that social communication is not necessarily language. Um, it's, they're very two different things. And it's just been um, really nice to, to be able to have that like more in-depth education in regards to like certain topics. It's been good. And that class is with students from different programs too. Is, is that like a good thing? <laughs> yeah, it, it's actually really interesting because we, uh, we have a lot of speech language pathologists um, that share that, um, that class. And it's very interesting to see their perspective versus us in HBCD as like developmental specialists. You know, like we are looking at all areas of development and they're only looking at language sometimes. So it's like something that they might miss. We are like, oh, but they're doing this with gestures and like, you know, their um, communication is different and they might, uh, you know, uh, also give us their perspective on like, oh, okay, but they're vocalizing this way and the intonation is different. So it's very, it's a very nice um, combination just of people to, have that uh, mix of perspectives and it, it helps really with the, the class. Maria, is there anything that especially has stood out to you about coursework? Yes. Uh, can you see me and hear me? Well, uh -huh. okay, that's great. Okay, thank you, Paula. I think Paula said a lot of good things. Uh, I would like to add two things like about the trauma-informed course, that class. I mean, that was a phenomenally good class for me. I think for all of us, we all would say the same thing. Uh, I felt like like until until the trauma class, we have all been talking about the disorder, you know, mostly physical disorders. But trauma has taught us the psychological aspect and I mean, I remember in one of my reflections, I wrote down like that course has inspired me to talk, to work with children with disabilities and with some other aspects where they're deprived. And one more course I'll be talking about is the autism course. I was looking forward to this course so much because for me, it's like, like understanding disorder is understanding autism is like I I to me it was a it was a major branch of disorder in early childhood. So Dr. D Dr. Michelle Alde, she has more than three decades of experience and knowledge. And moreover, she's the uh head of that communication disorder that so she she is doing an amazing job and there yet yeah, a lot of people most of them are from, it says two of us from early childhood. Most of them are from uh, speech language pathologies, but we have made new friends. We go, we talk, and uh, that class is a very good class. And yes, and uh, talking about this work experience, I would say, I think more or less we all have been working with, like we have some experience working with the kids, either RBTs, uh, personally, I have been working with in uh, kids like in early childhood school. We have RBTs. We have uh, friends we, who who have who have some experience working with the kids. I think that has been a lot helpful. Like you are learning something, and you are doing that in practical life, and you're doing something. You're coming back to school. You are talking with your instructor. You are talking and discussing with your friends, sharing them information and experience. That has been a lot helpful from my perspective. Uh, I think that's all. Thank you. That I think it's interesting to highlight the HDCD cohort is a pretty small group of students. We don't usually have, we have, um, you know, somewhere between eight and 12 students, sometimes up to 20 in our cohort. And 
but you get to interact with other groups too. So with the master's in psychology students, with other doctoral students and with other programs. And when you're thinking about becoming an ECI person, a person in ECI, like being able to work with all different kinds of practitioners and people is really important to your success and building that network of professionals, you know, to know who to reach out to when different things are happening. Um, That's a really important tool for being able to coordinate resources for a child. There are, these are just a few of the directions in which students from the HDCD program have gone. Many take on jobs in the field, often working into those jobs through their practicum and internship placements. This happens for some students nearly every year. Um, Developmental specialists work in a variety of settings to observe, assess, and intervene with very young children as needed. They also aim to support parents and families in working together and in finding resources. They work in settings like children's medical centers, uh, children's health center for autism, pediatrician's offices. Let's see. Uh, Early intervention specialists coordinate and provide services to children identified with developmental delays. Early childhood special education teachers work in public and private schools. In public schools, they're often working to either assess or implement individualized education plans or IEPs or what most people know those by. Curriculum development specialists help build educational programs for very young children, often in preschool settings. And this is so such a very needed thing. When kids are young, they're not just there to be, you know, babysat, there's so much we can do in the educational setting to help them start learning and growing and to really prepare them uh, for entering into school settings. Some students have also gone on to earn additional degrees, including doctoral degrees in a variety of fields. And there are lots of employment possibilities for our students. These are some examples from recent years. I'll talk about just a couple of them. Uh, The Warren Center is focused on early intervention. Children under age three are sometimes qualified for lots of different types of services like occupational therapy and speech therapy and so forth. ECI professionals help to coordinate those things and to support healthy caregiver child relationships. Their job is really to help teach parents to be able to do a lot of these things themselves. The first three years is a large group that focuses on educational opportunities that support infant mental health. They also offer endorsement opportunities, which is something that our students can take advantage of even while they're in the program. So it's um, sort of like a license. It's an endorsement or a certificate, something else that they can add to their title. Students go on to work at schools, public and uh, private. We have students at Grand Prairie ISD, a few recently. Life Path Systems is a nonprofit that helps people with intellectual and behavioral disabilities. And the UTD Center for Children and Families does all different kinds of outreach, um, like the Grow With Me and the Play With Me programs. One program does early assessment screening and the other program does um, It's a very structured play program that helps um, parents learn to play and intervene with their children. So the final slide we have here pertains to the admissions information. And I'm going to turn this over to Christy who supports this part of the process. Thank you, Dr. Grant. So um, our priority application deadline is February the 15th. Um, However, just know that um, the application is open now. So if you are interested in applying, um, um, the application is available on our admissions website. Um, So the priority application deadline is February the 15th. We do accept applications on a rolling basis until May the 1st. Um, And just like the MS Psychology Program, we only accept um, admissions uh, applications for the fall semesters for admissions, and that is uh, intentional. Um, and I think Dr. Dr. Grant, you kind of highlighted how our coursework, the way it is designed, it's the reason why uh, we only accept 
for the fall semesters. So with any graduate program at UT Dallas, the minimal requirement is to have a bachelor's degree. Applicants of the HDCD program uh, should have at least a 3.0 GPA on a 4.0 um, scale. And at the moment for fall 2025, uh, GR scores are um, optional. Um, we have a, um, an agreement where we can temporarily waive uh, the GR score requirement for the fall 2025 um, uh, cycle. Three letters of recommendations from individuals able to judge your potential for success in the program. I like to, I recommend that they come from um, professors from your undergraduate studies as much as possible. And um, also with your application, we require an essay outlining your academic interests and career goals. I feel like the essay or the narrative is a very important element of the application as this is your opportunity to show us or tell us what your um, academic and career goals are and, and how our program fits into your aspirations. With international applicants, um, the Office of Admission and Enrollment um, di dictates all uh, requirements as it relates to uh, like admission documents such as transcripts, as well as proof of English proficiency. Uh, we say that um, international applicants must submit a TOEFL score of at least 80 if you need more information about that, um, I would recommend, highly recommend that you reach out to the Office of Admission and Enrollment to get more information about that uh, specific requirement. Um, I will say that if you do decide to apply, there on the application is a question that asks you how you um, were referred or how you found out about the program. If you could please help us out um, by indicating in that on that question that you heard about it from my info session. That's one of the categories, uh, one of the options on that question. And that kind of gives us a, a, a idea of how, how these info grad fairs, how much of an impact it has to um, future applicants in uh, admission enrollment. Did I forget anything? I feel like I forgot something about the grant. Holistic, yes. can you can you just like kind of touch on how we look at each applicant uh, holistically? I can talk a little bit about that, yeah. Uh, we, we review applications in a committee and read your entire application package. Um, we're looking for being, you know, we're looking at the whole picture, not just focused in on any one score or whatnot. And we do spend a considerable amount of time evaluating, especially your personal essay and the recommendation letters, trying to really gain a sense of who you are and what your professional goals are and whether or not you would be a good fit in the program. Because if, if you're going to start and take part in a program like this, we definitely want you to be able to get something out of it and to be able to help you in reaching the professional goals that you're aiming towards or academic because you know, a number of people do go on to get other degrees. I love it. Thank you, Dr. Grant. Thank you, Christy. I think we're at the question and answer part. Are there any questions for us that we can help you with or, or for Paola and Maria who are both here too? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, Paola and Maria can give you um, um, the student perspective. It's one thing to hear from us as the uh, program head and academic support coordinator, but they're actually living, um, you know, the what you can anticipate in the program. So feel free, London and Sophia, to ask them any questions you would like to know about what it is like to be a student in the program. First, thank you for giving such a really good in-depth overview of the programs and, and offering. And I like to see that the GRE is optional. <laughs> I know with a lot of the other programs, it is not, which is which is fair. 
Um, and and having the student perspective will be very, you know, very helpful. Uh, like how you talked about the trauma. You said it was a trauma informed elective, and that's taking over this summer. Um, and then you mentioned us. Social communication, is, is that right? Social communication elective? Yeah, it's social communication disorders, and that's offered nearly every spring and fall, most, okay. most spring and falls. This is it's so important. It's so important. Um, and then there was an autism elective also. The autism seminar is not offered seminar. every year, but it is offered some years when, when we are able to provide that. Yeah. Okay. What's a seminar? Okay, so you mentioned this program, and I did sit on in on the other one of the other the psychology MS presentation. Um, you said research is not it's, requirement, right? Okay. So all of the curriculum is research based, and okay. you have some exposure to research design issues, especially in your developing infant and developing toddler class, because you're assigned to read lots of articles. And then you, in the number of the electives, you're taking those with doctoral students as well. And so the, to that degree, you need to be research literate. Mm -hmm. You have the option to engage in research in developmental labs if you choose, and you can do that for an elective credit. You also have the option to take the research design sequence of classes, the same that you would take the with the master's in psychology program if you wanted to, and they would count as electives for us. Um, if somebody were going on to get their doctoral degree, like that was the plan, then I might recommend that they plan to take those classes uh, during their second year, potentially. Yeah, and I'll add on to Dr. Grant. Um, my academic background is, is in social sciences. So what I, I love about this program is, yes, we're at a research university and research is very important. Um, at the same time, I believe in how theory informs practice, practice informs research, and how those three aspects, how they interplay and factor and influence one another. So it's, it's one thing to um, do the, the research, and it's another thing to learn about the theory, but applying that applied, um, when you bring in the applied aspect of it, I just feel like it's a, a full um, no, whatever, you know. I did ask in a, one of the other sessions about, so we're required to take a minimum of nine hours per semester. Is it maybe um, not recommended to take 12 hours? So your first semester, no. It would definitely not be recommended to take 12 hours. But we do have some students who take 12 hours their second semester or even beyond that. And I think you have the ideal student in this session, actually to talk to this, <laughs> to talk about this with, because Paula is a fast track student. So that means that she combined her first year of graduate work with her kind of her last year of her undergraduate degree and definitely took more hours than um, we would generally recommend in order to make that happen. Do you wanna to speak to that at all? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, <laughs> Yeah, it was uh, my first, I guess my first semester of the master's, right? I was still, um, it was my first semester of my senior year. I was taking the um, three classes for the master's and then two for undergrad. So that's what, 15 uh, credit hours? Yeah. And then the second uh, semester, so for the uh, spring, I was taking only 12 credits. Um, it was a lot. Uh, <laughs> it was definitely a lot. I understand that the level of classes for undergrad is definitely not the same as a master's. Um, but personally, I, I mean, I think it is doable if you are prepared for that workload. But 
it's it is um 12 wasn't as bad as 15 obviously but um <laughs> but um yeah you just have to like mentally prepare if that is something that you want to do it is doable um you have to have the time management skills of course to make sure that you are keeping track of everything and have enough time to study. Um, one thing about the master level classes is that there are a lot of readings, especially for your core classes. Um, there's a lot of textbook readings and a lot of research readings. So um, it is important to keep in mind like having time for all of that plus your assignments. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's doable if it's something you want to do, just be prepared. We have for fast track students also a fairly specific plan of study to help to help sequence courses and to help when it might be less painful to add another class and versus when it might be more painful. I'm not sure how to frame that exactly. Um, but I, I think bringing up the fact that master's level classes, it's not exactly the same as when you're taking an undergraduate class. The, the expectation is different. Um, Every time you go to class, you are just expected to have read whatever was assigned. And then that class is generally going to be about discussion. There is much, much less, um, if any, lecture. That's not something that is as frequently integrated into a graduate level class. And then, you know, assessment strategies are often quite different um, that there will be more essay and more writing and more presentations and more other kinds of assignments than you might see at the undergraduate level. And all these courses are taken on campus or some of them online? A good question. Um, the vast majority of them are on campus, but some classes are actually at other parts of camp, like at uh, call it at um other centers that are still part of UTD, but they're not the Richardson campus proper. Right. Um, we don't generally have asynchronous classes right now, uh, especially for somebody in this particular field. There's a lot of value to being in person mm -hmm. and interacting with each other because you know the, the job is in person and interacting as much as possible as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I don't um because I I muted myself so I don't know why I did that um because I'm working in education but on working with specifically with high school seniors that are transitioning from you know young adult well senior year of high school to young adult with our scholarship program I'm actually on my work computer so our logos in the background <laughs> got a meeting right after this so um I enjoy that aspect of connecting with the students and um, that social communication elective, like that's a really big piece of our work. You know, this is a different generation of students, but they really struggle with their social communication. They have, you know, all the resources possible and available to them. And sometimes it's just a click of a button, but they struggle with communicating or reaching for support of how how do I complete this step or how can I get access to this thing that's right in front of me? And sometimes it's simply like, well, you could just click a button, <laughs> but you could just complete the form. So um, I feel like a lot of these electives and courses that are offered in this program could really help me in, you know, other areas of work and, and career. So thank you for explaining everything and, and really talking about the electives outside of just the core, core curriculum. That's, it, that makes it, um, maybe not feel like work or like you're you're completing work, but you're really diving into this program and like uh, able to explore something of, of interest. So thank you. But thank I don't you. Have that sounds like a really cool job too. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. The high school kids are, they don't hold back their words. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right now we're helping students prepare for that December 1 FAFSA open with Last year's FAFSA was its own thing, so better FAFSA. <laughs> but, yeah, well, thank you so much. I do have to hop off into a, a meeting. Thank you for being here. Oh, and uh, you said there's a survey. Let me see. I want to make sure I can access it. Yeah, it's the same uh, survey um, that I put in the, the other, MS oh. Ecology one. 
Sophia, I see you here as well. Are you? Are there any questions we can answer for you? Um, I don't really have any specific like questions. I'm still um in the process of like getting my undergrad finished, so I'm just kind of exploring options right now. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess one thing that's on my mind is I'm kind of leaning towards like wanting to do like counseling with children. But I'm not sure, like, if you think this degree would kind of benefit that or, like, your, I just kind of want to know your opinion on that. <laughs> well, I think, I mean, I think it depends on what the end goal is. Um, you know, there are master's level degrees that involve counseling children. Um, there's play therapy and there's counseling psychology. There's getting, you know, a marriage and family license or there's getting an LPC licensure. And this program is not those things. This You don't get that degree from this program. And so there would be a misalign there. Now, if your plan, though, is that you want to apply to something like a clinical program where then you would go on to get that experience to be able to counsel children, or maybe you're applying, you know, you're um, using this as a stepping stone to get research experience to be able to apply to an advanced degree or to or for some other reason, then this is a good fit for you. It, it just kind of depends on where where you're ultimately headed. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Well, Paula and Maria, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for coming and being present for this um, no, and being on camera you. for us. Sure thing. <laughs> Can we stop thank the you, recording, Christine? <laughs> yeah. um, Sophia, um, do you have any more questions? Because uh, you're the Long, yeah, the, the long yeah the um, the participant. I'm all good session. now. I'm gonna go ahead and fill out that survey now. Okay. Well, I'm going to stop the recording, Dr. Grant.